My name is Kurt Budge. I'm the Chief Executive of Leading Edge Materials. Leading Edge is a Canadian public company. We're listed in Toronto and Stockholm, but traded in New York and Frankfurt. We have a portfolio of critical raw materials projects that are all located in the EU. Our flagship project is the Norshare Heavy Rare Earth Element project in Sweden. And tell me, tell me where you're at with regards to the, the PFS. Obviously, there's a lot of historic um, um, work done with, with PEAs and, and PFS in the, in the long distance past, but it's it's a different time now. So, um, how much how much work uh, are you going to be able to um, do on that, and and when? given it needs to be financed um, in, in this environment as well. Yeah, so we're, we're on with that now. We expect that we'll complete in the first half of next year. Um, the focus at the moment is very much on two, two key things, uh, understanding the mineral processing at site. So uh, we have 28,000 meters of drill core, which gives us a, a huge um, resource to be able to use for, for further test work. So we are doing mineral processing test work to really produce the highest grade concentrates, both the, the UDLite mineral concentrate that has a heavy rare earth in it, that we will then look to do hydrometallurgy on, and uh, also the Nephilim cyanide that we will then assess as whether or not we need to do further processing on that to produce products that go into the Nephilim cyanide market, ceramics, glass coatings, those kind of markets. So. So that's happening on the mineral processing. We're also uh, looking to upgrade the mineral resource because back in 2021, that was an inferred resource. It was an inferred resource because of the, the, the preliminary work that had only been done on the industrial minerals. Back in 2015 for the pre-feasibility study, you had a probable reserve on the, um, the rare earths themselves. So... Again, to, 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 to align with your point, we have this 16 years of technical work, studies that we want to leverage and not repeat. I mean, okay, I mean talk, talk to me though about some of the, the market assumptions that you're going to have to make around like pricing, demand, end users, et cetera, because you, you, know, you, you use words like nef nephilis, uh, cyanide, and agarine, I think it was called earlier. You're like, most people don't know what those things are. Uh, nor any sense of the market. I mean, how, how do you actually access data to actually do any work on that? On the Nephilim and Sinai specifically, we're doing a market assessment now with an independent consultant that we already did this work back in 2021 with another consultant. So we, we, we have a starting position of understanding. Uh, we're updating that understanding now. And, and there are established players. I mean, clearly industrial minerals is not the most uh, transparent marketplace. Uh, but you have within Europe, one of the key players is Sibelco in Norway that has a large Nephilim cyanide producing asset. So there's a good amount of data out there. So that, that closes off the industrial mineral side. I don't think we're, we're not doing a great deal of technical work too much on the agarine at the moment. Uh, that will come. But uh, then with regards to uh, the, the, the rare earths themselves, you know, there's plenty of uh, highly re respected market uh, analysts who are collecting data on the rare earth space. So we will come up with a pricing deck and update our basket value on, on the rare earth. So, you know, be able to go, do good modeling on the revenue line. And again, because this is a simple quarrying operation, in essence, at the extraction point, we can, uh, we can, we, we can come up with a decent set of numbers to, to have an economic case for extraction. Uh, and to your point earlier around, well, in advance of you having the downstream available, we can work it back as if we were going to send the material somewhere to be processed. And what would that give us as a, a mine gate price? So, yeah, we have all the data to we will have all the data available for us to update the PF to do a new PFS. OK, understood. Um, and perhaps I need to go away and do a little bit more work on it. But coming back to things like I'm trying, all I'm trying to work out is how does one actually get this to a point where it is can become a kind of commercial entity? It's it's got all of the licenses, permits that it, that it needs to be able to kind of move forward, and that's going to give the funders the confidence that they need to be able to give you the money to to go through the PFS and go through whatever studies you need to. You know, because we I think when we talked last time around, we talked about the kind of uh, Critical Raw Materials Act, and yeah, there's quite a few companies on there. You, you're you're not on there yet, are you? No, not what? yet. No, no. So no, I think no. that so what we lack is that, a, is, that a, is that a critical? Is that a critical 
element for you to have in place or do you not need it? It would have been lovely to have it first time round. Um, I think what everybody was learning about the process last time, um, it was literally like taking an exam. Uh, the EU employed an independent group of um, experts who assess the 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 projects. I think, you know, some of the, the projects got up and running are in jurisdictions which don't necessarily have the troubled permitting history that you have with European projects, um, where one minute you have a mining lease and next you don't, uh, for whatever reason. Um, so it would have been nice to have it. I don't think it's a deal breaker because I think by the time we've done our PFS, we're, we're, we're up and running effectively in terms of we get we get we get the meetings okay you know if i look at um i think you've you've done various rare earth interviews over the last few months but if i look at the linus announcement back in october about the expansion of their malaysian plant for uh heavy rare earth production you know their rated capacity for that nameplate capacity for that plant was 250 tons of dysprosium and 50 tons of terbium oxide Nora share is 248 tonnes of dysprosium and 38 tonnes of terbium oxides. So, you know, the, the, the really frustrating thing is that how the hell can we still be in this situation where the CEO of Vacuum Schmelzer is saying in Brussels that this is a crisis and this, we need to do something about this. And, and 14 year, 2014, this was um, stock for everybody to see that this was already a crisis back then. Um, we we need, I believe that as soon as we've got the PFS, you know, build it and they will come. So things start to fall into place. Right. OK, so things will fall into place, but I, I'm sure there's a lot of um, paddling under the water to, to move elegantly through, through you know, through, um, through the process. So just in terms of that kind of geopolitical risk thing, just sticking with that, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find problems with this so I can either dismiss them or, or, or not. So dysprosium and terbium, obviously, we, there's a lot of conversations going on out there at the moment. Um, the pricing has been, as it always is, is kind of erratic, you know, triggered initially by sort of Chinese export restrictions, et cetera, and relax a little bit later. And but when I when I look over to the US and I think of um, the MP deal, you know, where Department of US Department of War helped them, not just with it in, inserting a bunch of cash, but also maybe f fixing a floor price, which I think is going to be kind of critical for a lot of companies like yourself to understand. So you're not kind of moving through these kind of erratic tra trading patterns. So... It, are those sorts the sorts of conversations that are being talked about in Europe in case it eventually does sort of wake up, get out of bed and actually do something about it? Or is that a kind of conversation yet to happen? No, it's happening now. Uh, and, and really, it's a recurrent theme at something like uh, Brussels Raw Materials Week, um, both flaws and contract for differences. So it's, it hasn't happened yet. Um, but it needs to happen because um, every, what everybody understands is that there's a certain degree of manipulation taking place in the markets, and that's not to our advantage. I think what happens when, uh, and this is not me saying this, this is commentated on, but what happens when China, for whatever reason, decides to restrict exports is that that creates uh, a nervousness and an uncertainty. And I think that nervousness and uncertainty around securing future supplies will not go away now. So I think it's taken time, but it's finally dawning on people, we need to have a different setup. Because um, when, when, when the dysprosium or the terbium tap gets switched off, everybody's scrambling around to trying to procure the same resources. Uh, and that's when you get the, the spikes. When it comes to defense, and whether it be equipment or armaments, depending on what global alliances form, can we really be reliant on heavy rare earths that come from jurisdictions that may not necessarily be fully aligned with Europe? You know, in our manufacturing uh, processes to produce the equipment to the armaments we need. I don't know what the answer is to that question. I hope, and I thought this from uh, an event I went to earlier this year in Brussels, that um, 
when when the US was really falling out with China, I felt that the opportunity was for Europe to to form a stronger relationship with China. Clearly, it depends on what the world order looks like and whether or not China aligns with Russia. But uh, the opportunity, I believe, you know, chi China needs us and we need China. And I say us as a Brit talking about Europe, but that, that's that's kind of the thread. But at the same time, um, th having the diversification of supply is a healthy thing. What we have now is an unhealthy uh, dependency that has hurt us several times this year and is hurting um, critical industries that we all as citizens depend on, whether or not they be uh, for energy transition or security defence. Okay, it's tough out there. Um, and it's tough out there when you're a public company because you're burning through, through cash and you're going to have to be sensible and say, well, look, if I spend money, I think it will this way it's going to get rewarded. If I spend money another way, it's not going to get rewarded. You've got to be really efficient with your capital allocation. Uh, and in fact, you've got to be really efficient with the timing of when you go and raise capital to to advance all these things. So if, if I'm looking at you, like it's the end of the year now practically, um, what what do you do in 2026? Why, why why should I be interested? Oh, fundamentally, it's that uh, yeah, all CEOs of junior mining companies say we're going to have a transformational year. I'm no different in, in that respect. Um, I think for us, it's 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 a pivotal year because we're coming up against the mining lease uh, decision, and we hope to get that in the near future. And then we're going through to pre feasibility, and and it's not as if we're starting something new. It's not as if it's uh, unknown quantity. We've got 16 years of technical work. We're in a marketplace where um, we see rare earth companies left, right and centre getting support from governments that believe that having a critical mineral strategy that is funded is important for national security. And we're in the jurisdiction with Sweden, which is a leading mining nation within Europe. And if I listen to the current government, they want to, they want to have that position. They want to be seen as to be a leader. So I feel very positive about, you know, the trajectory that we as a company are on with Nora Share. And I think um, as we move closer to pre-feasibility study and we, we tick these boxes with the mining lease, then uh, we become more and more attractive. I think the key thing is that uh, when you look at the, the whole clamour around the heavy rare earths crisis that's kicked off in the last two weeks, um, both journalist coverage and comments by you know the CEO of Vacuum Schmelzer, that um, this isn't going away. And, 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 and what, what we've probably done a bad job is about explaining how important Nora Share is. And, and thankfully, you know, there's a direct comparison between what Linus is doing. And Linus is one of the key rare earth players in the market outside of China. So we're on a par with Linus and our resource is, you know, three to four years away from production. Okay, so, so we're, we're, but again, just talking in terms of those, for you, I understand the kind of the, the thesis now, you, you've been clear, in, in terms of what you've got to deliver to be able to do a PFS, to be able to raise um, capital, what, what, is, what does that actually, what's that actually look like? Because it, it seems to me this kind of partner, partnerships or collaboration needs, we need some clarity on what that, looks like where what the timing is on that yeah and i think that, that that's those are when you speak specifically about partnerships i think i'm going to be doing more work in this area because you know the the thought process that are going through my head are aligned with the thought process that are being considered by the downstream and and so they should want to talk to us and and, and we want to talk to them and those those interactions have already started in different ways so I can see that we can get to a position where we might have some of that in place by the time we put get the PFS signed off. We're not there yet, but you know these things are in fruition. No, and look, it's great when, I, when I've talked to it with Pensana in the past. You know, um, I, you know, I, I don't have any association with Pensana. I've just spoken to them, but you know, they they were kind of keen very early on to talk about. In principle, we have an agreement. Subject to, we have an agreement in place, and it just kind of gives people the kind of the, the, the color and flavor of the sorts of groups that um, value, I can validate you yep. in, in a way. Um, so it'd be interesting to sort of see what, what, how, you, how you get on in the first, first couple of quarters next year 
on that topic. So, um, Kurt, nice to sort of uh, catch up with you again. It's been over a year. Let's, let's try and talk a little bit more uh, regularly. Um, it's interesting time for Rara, especially the heavies. Yeah, thanks very much.